Why don't we get started? Thank you for joining us today for this discussion on the promises and pitfalls of, of gene therapy. So while gene therapy is an emerging exciting arena, there have been recent examples of setbacks. And in today's discussion, we're going to focus on three areas that require special attention. Chemistry, manufacturing and controls, CMC, dosing and regulatory considerations. I am excited to introduce our speakers for this morning. Um, first off is Brian Fermansky. Brian is Vice President of Regulatory Affairs at Crea Therapeutics. He was previously Senior Director of Clinical Pharmacology and Regulatory Affairs at NuVentra. And prior to that, he was a Senior Clinical Pharmacology Reviewer at the FDA, where he reviewed and provided regulatory and scientific, scientific advice on IND submissions and new drug applications and biologic license applications. He's also worked at GlaxoSmithKline and Sega Technologies. Brian received his PhD in biochemistry from the University of South Carolina and completed his postdoctoral fellowship at St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. Next, we have Pete. Pete Vandergraaff is Sertara's Senior Vice President of Quantitative Systems Pharmacology. He is also a professor of systems pharmacology at Leiden University in the Netherlands. Pete has more than 20 years of experience working in the pharmaceutical industry at leading companies such as Sanofi and Pfizer. He brings considerable skill and experience to QSP projects and contributes to the strategic development of scientific technology platforms at Sertara. He was the founding editor-in-chief of CPT, Pharmacometrics and Systems Pharmacology before becoming editor-in-chief of Clinical Pharmacology and Therapeutics. He received his doctorate at King's College, London. And we have Emily Woodward. Emily is Director of Customer Engagement at Sertara in our Regulatory Sciences Division. She has 15 year ex years of experience in biotech, pharmaceuticals, and diagnostic devices, spanning R&D, clinical development, and regulatory affairs. As the Director of the Customer Engagement Group, she pairs her diverse industry experience with her scientific background, building teams of scientists, writers, and consultants who are tailored to meet clients' evolving regulatory needs. Emily's passion lies in accelerating clinical programs for rare and orphan disease therapeutics. She received her doctorate at Vanderbilt University. So our agenda for today, we will start with Brian, um, who will talk about the landscape and regulatory context of gene therapy. Then uh, Pete will talk about using virtual patients to get the dose right the first time, which is especially critical in gene therapy. Then Emily will speak to how to navigate the regulatory pathways for gene therapies. Please note, we will take questions throughout this discussion. So feel free to put them in the Q&A area. We'll also leave some time at the end for Q&A. If we don't get to address all of your questions this morning, we will circle back with you afterward. And uh, just wanna note that we are recording this session to share broadly, and we'll also send you a link um, after uh, the, the session today. So next, I am going to turn it over to Brian. But thank you, Jim, for that kind introduction. So at a high level, a gene therapy involves the removal, change, or introduction of new genetic material. And this genetic material is typically introduced into cells via a viral or non-viral vector, which can then be directed towards selected cells in vivo or applied simply ex vivo. An in vivo example would be Luxterna, which uses an AV2 viral vector to deliver the RPE65 gene into retinal pigment epithelial cells into the eye directly. An ex vivo application would be the recently approved Tacardis, which is a CD19 genetically modified T cell or CAR T for the treatment of adult patients with refractory mantle cell lymphoma. Now, while there are only a few approved gene therapies to date, the market for these therapies is growing exponentially. This year, the market value is approximately expected to be about $3 billion. And the annual growth rate for these types of therapies is expected to be 20% per year for the next seven years. The pharmaceutical industry has programs in truly a wide variety of disease areas under investigation. However, most of the focus is in ophthalmology, oncology, neurology, neuromuscular, and metabolic disorders. I would also mention that there are a significant number of phase two and three therapies being developed. According to the NIH, there are approximately 7,000 rare diseases with an estimated 300 million people worldwide living, living with one or more of these rare diseases. 
Most of these rare, rare diseases are monogenic in nature and approximately 70% of them start in adulthood. While gene therapy is particularly relevant to rare diseases, it could also be applied to non-rare polygenic diseases such as diabetes or cardiovascular disease. For example, my company Crea Therapeutics has a gene therapy program for the treatment of type one diabetes, as well as other interests in ophthalmology and immuno-oncology. Gene therapies are really extremely complex and challenging. The field is, is itself only in its infancy with only a few handful of approved products as mentioned before. And this figure is just meant to very simply illustrate the complexity uh, in for gene therapy in terms of scale. And so for small molecules, I like to think of them as a bicycle. They're relatively simple machines. Most individuals know how they work and they can be assembled relatively easily. For biologics, I think of them more as an airplane. Most people have a comprehension of what it is. However, few, few truly understand the mechanics behind it. And it takes a team of technically skilled personnel to assemble one correctly. For gene therapies, I really equate these to more being like a space mission in which you're trying to launch that rocket as well as subsequently afterwards assemble a space station. Uh, for these advanced therapies, very few people even understand the basic, have a basic understanding of what it is, let alone the me mechanics behind it. And it really takes an a, a army of highly trained scientists to tackle it. And all of this is due to the fact that gene therapies are really complex in almost every facet, from the characterization of the gene therapy itself to the CMC process, the manufacturing, as well as the production. Dosing is extremely complicated. And then also understanding its safety and efficacy. For example, immunogenicity is simply not one evaluation as it is for a monoclonal antibody. For an AAV gene therapy, you need to be concerned about the immunogenicity of the capsid, which is the delivery vehicle, the expression cassette, or the DNA that gets transcribed, as well as the development of antibodies to the transgene product or what is expressed from the cell. And that's more traditional, like you would expect for an ADA event to a monoclonal antibody. I think one thing that grabs uh, the, the public's attention quite a bit is really the cost of gene therapies. While I agree that the costs are extremely high, one of these reasons for the cost being so high is due to the complexity of manufacturing of these gene therapies. Please remember that for an AAV gene therapy, it's not simply manufacturing and characterizing one protein like it is for a biologic. It's actually several proteins that have to come together that are then encapsulate that piece of DNA. That DNA expression cassette then produces the transgene product of interest in transduced cells, which then eventually will elicit its pharmacological activity. And all this complexity is why you hear a common phrase in the gene therapy manufacturing world, and that your process is your product. Being that changes in your manufacturing process can alter, make alterations to your product and switching these processes clinically can be very costly and send your program back all the way to tax or preclinical studies. Being in that the, you've altered your product in such a way that the health authorities or FDA would consider it a brand new product. This complexity and inability to change has led some in the industry to simply expand manufacturing to thousands or hundreds of thousands, if not a million square feet in manufacturing capacity, just simply for one product. This has resulted in a very high cost of goods for the therapies. And as, as a field for rare diseases, it's unsustainable. And as we march toward more prevalent diseases, the cost of good for manufacturing simply has to change. This has even gotten the attention of health authorities around the world. Individuals at the FDA have stated many times that they are interested in helping companies refine their processes to help reduce the cost of gene therapies. This is something we take heart at Crea Therapeutics as well, in which we are laser focused and heavily invested in reducing the cost of gene therapies through our advanced manufacturing techniques. The goal of a gene therapy is really typically to have a long durable expression of a therapeutic uh, from a single dose. While this has revolutionized the field of medicine and opened the doors to treating both monogenic rare diseases as poly and polygenic diseases, it does create some complexity when you're thinking about your clinical trial and how to best treat your patient. For example, generally, there is no way of stopping or modifying this dose in that you only have a single shot, so you better get it right the first time. 
Also, you have to think about the patient characteristics long-term, being that patient status can change over time. For example, renal impairment status can change or renal function can change over time and typically declines with age. And so for biologics that are renally cleared, you have to consider that they, those biologics could increase in concentration with decreasing re renal function, which may create problems for your drug if, you're, if your therapeutic does not have a substantial or wide enough therapeutic range because you simply can't modify the dose after you've been given. And as I mentioned before, immunogenicity is multifaceted and very complex. One of the other differences for gene therapies comparatively to small molecules and biologics is the requirement for long-term follow-up studies in patients. And depending on the gene therapy, they can range from as much as 15 years to as little as five years in which you're required to follow these patients through a clinical study. I think for me in 2021, the way I see gene therapy evolve is very much like how a monoclonal antibody field was back in the early 90s. The cost of goods were very high for production. The production itself was very poor. Uh, the therapies were really not well understood at that time, but the treatments really did tru truly revolutionize medicine for that time period as they do so today. I think also the pandemic has had an appreciable and lasting effect on the way clinical trials are conducted and information is collected from patients. Decentralized clinical trials and remote investigations have become much more common due to the pandemic. Lastly, I would just state that as a former clinical pharmacology reviewer at FDA, that, I th that although gene therapies are different than traditional modalities, standard clinical pharmacology principles still apply, and that dose optimization and prediction are absolutely critical to the success of your program, as well as the well-being of your patients. So at this time, uh, I would welcome any questions if, if you have them. If not, I will turn it over to Pete. Okay, so uh, Pete, moving to your section. All right, thank you, uh, Brian. And so in the next part, uh, I will discuss the challenges of dose selection in gene therapy and how at Satara we have developed a virtual patient platform to tackle these challenges across indications and at all stages of gene therapy development, which I will illustrate with a recent real life case study. So as Brian explained earlier, selecting the right dose in gene therapy is very challenging. And a different strategy is needed compared to more conventional drug therapies. Dose escalation within an individual is typically not possible. And each patient can only receive a single shot since the immunogenic response against the viral vector uh, may make subsequent doses ineffective. So if you're too cautious and give too low a dose, a patient may be excluded from any, any future benefit of the treatment. On the other hand, giving too high a dose can be very dangerous since any side effects may be irreversible and could last for years, if not decades. Clearly, the definition of a narrow therapeutic index takes on a whole new meaning in gene therapy. You really need to get the dose right the first time in every patient. To make things even more challenging, there are also no established pharmacokinetic, pharmacodynamic, or PKPD approaches available for gene therapy. And related to this is the issue that the translational utility of preclinical models in the context of dose prediction is unclear. So what this means is that preclinical models, such as mouse and non-human primates, are very important to explore the mechanism of action and establish confidence in efficacy in the disease of interest, but how to convert this information to predict the all-important human dose is not well understood. As discussed earlier, conventional dose-finding approaches, typically used in early clinical development, do not apply in gene therapy. The first administration will be given to patients, often with rare diseases. A combined phase one, two study may therefore only comprise of a dozen or so patients. 
with such a small sample size, predicting variability between patients and how this may be linked to individual patient characteristics, like for example, body weight, is not something statistical modeling can typically solve in gene therapy. So these challenges are indeed spelled out in the regulatory guidelines for gene therapy, such as the one from the FDA Center for Biologics Evaluation and Research and the Office of Cellular Tissue and Gene Therapies as shown here. Motivated by these challenges and the opportunity to impact gene therapy development, some three years ago, we started the, the development of a so-called virtual twin quantitative systems pharmacology platform to guide individualized dose selection. Quantitative systems pharmacology, or QSP, is the discipline that through mathematical modeling and biosimulation builds confidence in the therapeutic and its biological targets in the context of a specific disease. It links principles and best practices from pharmacokinetics and dynamics on the one hand and systems biology on the other, and therefore links pharmacological activity to modification of disease in a quantitative manner. As I will show later, the output from such QSP models are virtual trials where we can simulate the predicted output in different patient populations, taking into account, for example, differences in patients' body morphometry. We can also create virtual patients for specific populations of interest, for example, the elderly and pediatrics. We can run many virtual trials before going into trials with actual patients to decide the optimal design and dosing regimen. We have now used this approach in more than five programs in various diseases across all stages of gene therapy development, from preclinical, translational, phase one, two, to phase three. And the model is continuously being updated and refined with new data. In recent years, regulatory agencies have embraced QSP to inform drug development decision-making. And the virtual trials developed for the case study I will show next were indeed submitted to FDA and other regulatory agencies by our clients in support of a global phase three gene development program. What is particularly exciting about this approach is that it allows us to create so-called virtual twins for each individual patient, which is an in silico computer clone of an actual patient. We can create such virtual twins before a patient receives their actual treatment and therefore can individualize the dose. There's no time to go into the detail of the actual QSP model but you can think of it as a mathematical representation of all the detailed biological processes that occur between when a gene therapy gets administered and the expression of the therapeutic effect. For example, for a typical AAV gene therapy after administration of the viral vector, the first step is the docking of the viral capsids to membrane receptors followed by step two, internalization of the capsid via endosomes. The capsids then either get degraded, highlighted by step three in this schematic, or they reach the nucleus, step four, where the viral single-stranded DNA is converted to persistent circularized episomes, step five, which drive continuous synthesis of the target protein, number six which could, for example, be an enzyme that is lacking in the patient due to a genetic defect. In our platform, we have embedded such core models into so-called physiologically based pharmacokinetic or PBPK framework, which allows us to simulate distribution and elimination of both the gene delivery modality itself, as well as the target protein to various organs such as liver, kidney, spleen, and for example, the brain in case of neurological disorders. 
because we have PBPK databases for many different populations, we can tailor the model to individual patient characteristics, in which case the model becomes a virtual twin or specific patient cohorts, which we call virtual patients. The model can first be tested and calibrated with preclinical data and then be scaled to make human dose predictions before any clinical data has been obtained. When clinical data for the first actual patient becomes available, the model is updated and refined, and we can create our first virtual twin. For the next patients, we can now create a virtual twin before the re they receive the actual treatments and therefore can individualize their dose. Real-time and actual precision medicine applied to early clinical development. Following completion of the phase 1-2 trial with a dozen or so patients, we can now scale the virtual twin approach up and generate many virtual patients using distributions of, for example, body morphometry in the expected phase 3 study population. So now we can generate thousands of virtual patients and simulate virtual trials exploring different doses, dosing regimens, and study designs. Here you see the anonymized output from a virtual trial for an actual gene therapy development program we worked on with a company in a rare hematological disorder. These results were submitted to regulatory agencies in support of the phase three design. From left to right, you see simulations of three virtual phase three trials with a thousand virtual patients each with increasing doses. The bars indicate the percentage of patients achieving the targeted efficacy in green. How many patients were underdosed in blue and how many virtual patients received too high a dose, amber and red which in this specific case could lead to serious side effects. Using the special population databases I mentioned earlier, we can now change the characteristics of the virtual patients and therefore a similar approach can be used to guide dosing in specific populations, for example, pediatrics. The next step, which I don't think is very far away, would be to apply the virtual twin approach to clinical practice and use the platform as a companion tool for personalized precision dosing in actual patient care. Before I hand it over to Emily to discuss the regulatory landscape, I'm of course more than happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Hi, Pete. Um, would you be able to speak a little bit more uh, around immunogenicity, which Brian had touched upon earlier, and, um, and, and how it relates to gene therapy? Yeah, that's a great point. And, and uh, I didn't cover that in my uh, talk, but I, should, it's, I can probably uh, talk a little bit about it now. So um, actually, um, some four years ago, um, we started a consortium around the development of an immunogenicity platform with um, seven major pharmas. So that consortium has now entered its fifth year and we have a very extensive um, virtual patient platform to predict immunogenicity, um, which has now been validated with more than 20 clinical case studies. Now the initial focus of that platform has been mainly on um, uh, you know, biological therapeutics such as monoclonal antibodies and uh, proteins. Um, last year, um, we focused a lot of our uh, efforts and refocused it uh, on uh, using the platform to also guide um, COVID-19 vaccine developments. And we have now been uh, using our platform uh, for uh, both RNA and uh, viral vector type COVID vaccines, working with several pharma companies. So that has brought us a lot closer to uh, being able to start to use our platform for gene therapy too. 
and uh, hopefully next time we meet I can I can talk a little bit more about that. Great, thanks Pete. So now we'll turn it over to Emily to talk about the regulatory landscape. Thanks so much, June. Um, so Brian's given an excellent overview of the landscape of um, <clears throat> the uh, gene therapy space. And Pete has spoken in detail about one strategy that can be used to accelerate development. And the regu regulatory landscape is of course, no less complex um, because there are so many stakeholders to satisfy. And recently we've seen reports of hurdles pop up in the news um, as described by this slide. And it's not particularly surprising there's a confluence of things happening all at once, right? Uh, the number of gene and cell therapy products and development is increasing. The number of companies going through the process of meeting with health authorities and ultimately seeking review of their data packages and also you know, seeking review for marketing approval is increasing. And the level of experience and knowledge that everyone in this entire ecosystem has um, is increasing. And that includes the, the experience that the health authorities themselves have. So there are bound to be recalibrations along the way, and we've seen some evidence, as, as I said, of this in the news in the form of delayed or discontinued programs, clinical holds, and more data being uh, requested by the health authorities, sometimes pretty late, even in a development program. And what I'd like to highlight today is a critical component for success in gene and cell therapy development, and that's communication. So not just any uh, run-of-the-mill de-siloing type of communication that we always cite as a critical part of therapeutics development, but a cross-functional, longitudinal, and systematic approach to communication throughout the development life cycle. Um, that's, that's really what I'm talking about here. Eliciting feedback, information, data expectations, and priorities from all of what I'm gonna call the end users of a new therapy. So end users, I'm going to use pretty broadly here. Of course, that includes patients and their caregivers, um, but it also includes anybody who is consuming your data, right? So health authorities such as FDA and EMA, healthcare professionals, <clears throat> and even the payers um, who are often not engaged until quite late in development. Um, payers can be considered end users in that, again, they are consuming your data um, in order to make a decision about reimbursement. And the idea being, if you, you know, you would, as a sponsor of pharmaceutical developer, you would take this approach um, in order to streamline and focus your development program so that you can meet the needs of all these different groups in the most efficient way possible and get those products to patients even sooner. So with increasing rarity of disease and therefore the target patient population getting smaller and smaller, um, there comes a need to be more creative with the types and sources of data that are being leveraged to support the decisions that guide the development program. And that also support these conversations that you're wanting to have with health authorities and payers early on in your development program. So leveraging non-traditional uh, data sources and uh, non-traditional basically means anything that is not a prospectively planned uh, randomized control trial. Uh, that's sort of the, the nomenclature jargon around it. So this includes things like prospective registries, natural history studies, maybe surveys or patient focused development meetings. Um, and of course, retrospective or case history um, type studies, case controlled studies. All of those can be viable sources of data. Um, to fulfilling the requirements that agencies and payers have to, to make their decisions. And of course, as a disclaimer, you should always, uh, as, a, as a sponsor, discuss these plans to leverage non-traditional data with the agency early and frequently during, during your development program. Um, and so speaking of the agencies and, you know, getting approval is the end goal here. I'd like to note that gene and cell therapies um, should and can leverage the existing approval mechanisms that are already available to any new therapeutic that represents a substantial improvement over existing treatments. And those designations everyone has heard of, um, you know, such as Fast Track and Breakthrough and RMAT in the U.S. and Prime in the EU. Um, there are more. That's, that's just a sample. Um, but one of the benefits of getting um, any of these designations actually is increased frequency of communication with FDA or EMA. And of course, that supports the strategy of cross-functional and longitudinal communication that I'm talking about here. 
And so while we're on the topic of, of meetings and talking to the agency via meetings, um, in addition to the standard ones that occur at checkpoints throughout drug development for, for any product, such as a pre-IND meeting or an end of phase two meeting, there are two additional meetings that can be quite useful to gene and cell therapy developers, and that's the Interact meeting and the CAP meeting. Um, the Interact meeting is sort of a pre-pre-IND meeting, so it happens pretty early. Um, in the non-clinical or preclinical phase of development. And this meeting is um, used to discuss early proof of concept and product characterization studies, for example. Um, the CAT meeting, on the other hand, is primarily for new technologies or platforms that can impact product development, manufacturing, or CMC strategies. Um, so one is for a product that definitely has a target patient population and indication um, outlined, and the other is for a platform um, or, or your, your packaging mechanism or anything else that would be CMC related that's non-product specific. And the kinds of questions that can be discussed with the agency at some of these meetings, not just the interacting cap, but um, the, the pre-IND and into phase two, et cetera, are listed there on the right-hand side of the slide. And those include things like, particularly early in development, are my proposed surrogate endpoints appropriate? You know, if you're going for an accelerated approval or is our plan to overcome some kind of specific hurdle either in manufacturing or, or clinical study design, are those acceptable and appropriate? And to illustrate some of these topics, I'd like to go over a little case study, I guess, or an example that we had with a sponsor um, that we helped to put in an IND um, application for. And they had made use of the Interact meeting and had also very successfully leveraged their cross-functional communication pathways, both internally um, at, within their own organization and also uh, cross-functionally with us. So the sponsor was developing an AAV vector um, and they wanted to deliver a normal copy of an enzyme in a tissue specific manner um, in order to restore uh, function for an inborn deficiency. So pretty, what I would call straightforward, um, you know, gene therapy if such a thing is, is true or exists. Um, this was their first IND um, and that is not surprising. This is gonna be very um, typical in that a lot of the developers are, you know, growing out of academics, um, <clears throat> academic labs and may or may not, you know, be spinning up into their own little biotech or maybe they got bought or whatever else happened, but it's, it's very not uncommon uh, for this to be their first IND. Now they were the absolute experts on their science, their mechanism of action of their platform and the disease pathology um, of the disease that they were trying to treat. What they were struggling with, of course, was how do we present all of this data that we have accumulated um, both preclinical, non-clinical data, as well as manufacturing data. How do we package it in an IND so that we get the best result? <clears throat> um, and as I said, it's not a unique situation at all um, to sponsors in general and particularly to gene and cell therapy companies. So they had, as I mentioned, they had used an Interact meeting or leveraged an Interact meeting, um, and they had used the feedback from that meeting to um, inform the design of their preclinical studies. Also, what um, they learned from the Interact meeting and their pre-IND meeting were the kinds of things that FDA was very interested in um, or concerned about. And <clears throat> topics that they knew might turn into issues if they didn't address them proactively. So we used our expertise to craft their data into an IND. It cleared without any kind of issue or comment. And what we did was um, we took their data and we took the feedback from the FDA in the form of their Interact and Pre-IND meetings um, and used that to guide the packaging of, of their data and the messaging that we used throughout the IND. And this example, of course, you know, as I said, speaks to the advantages of the early and frequent communication with the agency, as well as the importance of those cross-functional um, lines of communication, particularly um, when you're writing your IND while some of your final studies are still ongoing, which is also not, uh, not a unique situation. Um, as sort of a, well, what happened next, you know, after they, uh, after they put in their IND, I did see a press release that um, they have posted positive phase one, two um, results from their study and their ongoing study in adults. 
um, they are using a primary endpoint that is considered clinically meaningful um, by the agency and that they would ultimately be able to submit their BLA on actually. Um, so I think that they, it was pretty obvious that they discussed that endpoint selection with the agency and got their buy-in there as well. Um, <clears throat> and they're also using an adaptive design um, in their current phase one, two study that is gonna allow them uh, to evolve that study uh, basically into their pivotal study um, if everything goes well. And the design and, and escalation of that study, it would have been something that they probably would have um, addressed or discussed with the agency and well, as well. So all, all in all, a very good um, example of putting the work in on the communication front to streamline a clinical program and hopefully get to market a little bit quicker. Um, so with that, I'll open it up to questions for my section or to, for the rest of the, uh, for the rest of the talk. Great. Thank you, Emily. So, uh, if, uh, you have a question, please put them into the Q and A area and, and we'll open it up, uh, for discussion. So uh, one topic that I thought we should dive a little bit deeper into is COVID-19. So the mRNA vaccines, what, what do you think has been the impact of the COVID vaccines uh, in, in gene therapy? Who wants to start? <laughs> I'll yeah, just say that. Uh, thank you, Brian. I was just going to say that without uh, without being an expert in CMC myself, my hope is that um, the the immensely high throughput um, that is necessary, you know, to to create these these things on scale will have uh, knock on effects for for gene and cell therapies that need to utilize some of the same manufacturing techniques, um, whether or not they're an RNA themselves, you know, or anything. But um, so it could be as 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 minor uh, as cell culture or or, you know, as complex as uh, maybe plasmid scaling up or anything like that. Um, so I, I hope that that'll have a lot of knock-on effects there. Go ahead, Brian. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, no problem. Uh, I mean, I think it's had both pros and cons. I think in pro some pros, as, as you mentioned earlier, there's been some advances in, in certain aspects of manufacturing. Uh, telemedicine has become much more prominent. You know, the, the idea of decentralized clinical trials is actually taking off quite a bit now. So I think you know that has been part of what the pandemic has probably uh, you know emphasized and you know moved forward more quickly than would have traditionally been done. I think some of the negatives have been on the inspection size, the delays. You know, FDA itself is not really going out and doing inspections because of this the COVID pandemic. So things have been delayed in, in certain instances for molecules that are um, that have. Uh, issues or, or components that needed further investigation. And maybe I can, I can add, I mean, obviously COVID is impacting so many different areas of our life and it's still unfolding. So the longer term impact on, you know, gene therapy development or drug development in general, I think we'll still need to kind of wait and see, but um, just a few thoughts. Uh, I already mentioned uh, th that we we really driven by COVID, um, you know, repurposed our immunogenicity platform um, towards vaccines, which we hadn't been doing before. But really, that was catalyzed by by COVID, um, and we could really kind of very quickly do that and, and apply it now to, you know, RNA therapies, um, etc. So I think that's going to be a a. Uh, you know, really great starting points and, and something that I, I think we and others will do a lot more of. I also think you can now start to see that, you know, for the first time we have been using these RNA technologies very successfully, that that means they will not just be restricted to, you know, using infectious diseases, but also in, for example, you know, cancer. I also think it, it has really kind of um, opened people's eyes uh, uh, you know, on the topic of the importance of dose and dose regimen. Um, I think Brian mentioned, you know, I, I don't think clinical pharmacology and model informed drug development ha had played a 
significant role in, for example, vaccines, you know, development until COVID. And I think that has really changed now. And people really kind of understand that the importance of dose, dose sequence, combination therapy, et cetera, all the questions that clinical pharmacologists and, you know, quantitative, you know, people like myself and others have been working on in other areas are now kind of really becoming very critical in that. And for example, the use of virtual patients, you know, the same idea as I talked about in gene therapy, that clearly in COVID, we can't just run clinical trials for every next variant that comes along and just continue to do that all the time, right? We have to, and we've learned that, you know, we can we can move very fast, we can, but we have to kind of, you know, start to use these, these things in real earnest to make sure that we speed things up. And I think that will have a really positive impact on other areas, including gene therapy. Thank you. Um, next, let's go into, you know, Brian, you mentioned earlier that most rare diseases are monogenic in nature and 70% um, or, or more start in childhood. Could we talk about the implications of that, that many of these uh, gene therapies would be maybe directed to children and how that might pose any particular issues or questions during development? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's, a, it's a great point. I think, you know, although most monogenic diseases can start in childhood, they do have adult forms. And I still think most sponsors and probably most regulators, you know, would prefer to start in the, the adult form of that disease and then work backwards to the pediatric. Uh, and now there are certain instances where it is only a pediatric disease where lethality occurs within that span of time. And so you only have that patient population to investigate your therapy in. Um, as a former reviewer and someone who's signed off on pediatric protocols, it is more, uh, you know, there is more scrutiny paid, uh, you know, not, not more scrutiny, but there is certainly a, a different level. Uh, and there's committees that are involved for pediatric reviews. Uh, and so I think it's just it is part of the considerations. There are a lot less clinical trials being conducted in pediatrics solely. And so there's a lot less information. And so you have to really weigh the options very carefully um, when you're thinking about starting a clinical trial solely in a pediatric uh, population pr prior to having adult data. And then on the other side from, you know, patient voice uh, type considerations, you, you know, you talk to the parents of these kids and everything, and they are absolutely, you know, clamoring uh, to, to get these things accelerated so, so that they can have their kids um, <clears throat> treated. So it, that, that again is one of those situations where you want to start talking to all levels of folks, if that is the kind of uh, disease that you're going to go after, because I agree with Brian completely. It's like the, the normal paradigm is you, you do it in adults first. Um, so when that's not possible, you know, take into account, um, the other viewpoints of the stakeholders. That... I know, maybe I can just add my kind of perspective from the, the topic I was covering that, yeah, it, clearly the, 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 the two other speakers make a very important point that unlike in other drug development areas in gene therapy, in these cases, you don't have the luxury almost that you have adult data first. Um, and, you know, even if you have adult data in other areas, it's, it's still quite challenging to kind of, you know, scale that to children, but here you have to get it right you know, without that, again, I think that's where virtual patients could really come in, because at least what we can do is, you know, we can we can start with virtual patients and at least kind of get it right there and then then scale it to, you know, actual patients and in this case, children. Great. Well, thank you so much for attending and thank you for our, our speakers um, and for joining us today. Have a great thank day. Thank you.